Welcome. My name is Kate Sabinko and I'm going to interview Simon Bailey, one of the editors and co-writers of the book Projectification of Public Sector. Simon is a research fellow at the University of Kent, where I am a policy student and I can't wait to talk to Simon about his research. Good afternoon, Simon. Good afternoon. Simon, I'm just about to complete my policy officer course at the University of Kent, and our study program includes a whole module on project management. Um, can you please share your thoughts on how project management knowledge could complement policy making? Sure, that's a, a great question. So, when we talk about projectification, we are thinking about um, how the tools and techniques of project management are becoming implied in, in sectors where we might not have expected them to be before. And the public sector is the one we focused on, um, partly because it, it, it seemed to be quite a new phenomenon or a growing phenomenon, and partly because we think there are things that make the sector quite distinct, um, which mean that the application of policy technique, uh, <laughs> project techniques rather, um, is not necessarily straightforward. So um, I think policy making is, it tends to be uncertain, it can be uh, a very kind of messy set of processes and, and decision making and I think you know projects can maybe bring some of that to light and, um, and can impose some order on it perhaps, um, is one of the opportunities that might be, might be there. Your book is about projectification of the public sector. How would projectification of public sector differ from projectification in other sectors of society? Um, well, I think that really relates to this uh, distinctiveness that there is to politics and policy making. So, policy making is a very open ended process. Um, it's very difficult to predict how particular types of policy or kinds of policy ideas, how they're going to land in different areas. There's a lot of uncertainty. And so, that whole attempt to um, project into the future to create a project and to manage against a set of targets becomes much more difficult when you're, when you're in a sector like that, I think. So the efficiency or value for money of public sector projectification is much less straightforward than, let's say, in IT or engineering environments and may come with a number of downsides? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I'm not an expert in those environments, but I think... I think there's a efficiency and effectiveness are, are very important values, and obviously when you're spending public money, it's important to to be able to show that you're doing so sensibly and responsibly. Um, but those are not the only values that are that are present in the public sector. So it's there's a lot of different kind of values, a lot of different interests, and a lot of these have been around much longer than any one government. You know, they're kind of inherited. Uh, they're part of our of our political fabric, of our cultural fabric, if you like. So I think it's a, it's a very difficult undertaking to move into that and say, here's a different way of working, which is project management, and these are the processes. And, and so the interesting thing for us is to watch what happens when, when one kind of comes into contact with the other and, and, and what some of the issues are and what some of the limitations of, of trying to do that are. Thanks, Simon. I'm interested in the way in which language is adapted to achieve depolitization. Project management has its own lexicon and metaphors, for example, rock, uh, traffic light system, or dashboards. It is described in your book how uh, project management terminology focuses solely on managing uncertainty throughout a project's delivery from A to B, rather than political accountability uh, during top-down policy delivery. What are your thoughts on this, please? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think um, I think that whole question of uncertainty is really interesting because for the project manager, uncertainty relates and, uh, on how to get from A to B. So anything that stops me getting from A to B or threatens my journey from A to B, those are the things that I want to try and manage that I, and that I'm uncertain about. I think the sources and kinds of uncertainty that politics and policy making is subject to are much more varied than that. So... Um, so I think when you start to think about things like rag ratings or dashboards, which are obviously extremely effective instruments for managing performance, I think you also have to think about what those things are not seeing. So, you know, they have a, a particular way of looking at things. What they can't tell you um, is whether, 
you know, whether we even want to get to B or whether we want to debate where we want to go to or how we're going to involve different people in that process or which interests matter for a particular problem. You know, those are not the things that project managers debate or decide upon. It's not their jobs. But if they're going to come and do this job within a sector in which those are important issues, then that's where some of that conversation needs to go on between, between the two camps, I guess. Thanks. In your chapter of the book, Uh, you explain how projects create a state of exception in which uh, project deadlines and transparency through enhanced reporting make project teams work extra hard, sometimes to a fault. But do you think there is the reverse and that exceptional project's quality, its uniqueness, makes it very hard to compare one project to another and so uh, project costs can overrun and inefficiencies creep in. Yeah, I, th- I think that is absolutely one of the dangers. I think um, the whole idea of a state of exception is that you you create this this thing which, you know, you're trying to get hold of a pot of money or whatever it is and you, and you kind of create this unique object. And so there's, a, there's an essential kind of tension there against... Um, being able to compare it or replicate it, you know, the kind of experimental conditions that you might think go along with, with trying different ideas out or with piloting different ideas, I think those are really challenged uh, within that kind of scenario. And so the, the project, the, you know, the, the project becomes a poor test of how well it might work in practice. It becomes a poor representation of how well it might fit in other areas or how sustainable the work might be if everyone's putting in overtime and doing this exceptional kind of work levels then then the product that comes out at the end of it is not a realistic object uh, potentially I'm interested in one of the themes in the book on how the European Union is highly reliant on projects um, would you agree that perhaps uh, projectification of European Union um, impacted how voters perceived the EU and perhaps contributed it to the feelings of remoteness and political disconnect that eventually manifested in Brexit? Um, I think that's a great question, but I'm not sure if I can answer it um, fully, given how many different um, problems there are going on underneath something like Brexit. So I think, I think projects are definitely a big part of the EU. I think you're right to point that out. I think they're a really important part of the way in which the EU tries to manage that sense of disconnectedness from its members. Um, you know, I think the EU is an incredibly complex thing, it's an incredibly complex phenomenon. It, you know, its members are not just individuals or even organisations, but whole nation states, each with their own governance processes and, and political interests and, um, and histories, you know. So I think there are all sorts of ways in which voters can feel quite disconnected from a huge organization like that and from the other side I think being that organization it can be quite hard to um, to implement um, in a way which is effective and you know I think they have official uh, responsibility for things which they don't have effective responsibility over because they're just not able to to compel members to necessarily act in the way they want them to so projects can help them on both sides of that I think you know they can be seen to be doing things they can hand out money in a way that they can control um, and it's an incentive for members to to behave and to and to move towards the goals that the EU wants to set for them. So whether or not uh, the failure of that kind of system is is part of the, the conversations about Brexit, you know that that's a bigger stretch, uh, one that I couldn't make um, within you know uh, without doing a lot of uh, of research. But uh, it's definitely a, an interesting question, and I think projects are definitely part of that discussion. Thanks, so. Sam. In project management courses, training is all about uh, tools for planning, uh, risk assessing, reporting, evaluating. Do you think there is a space for more training on how project management tools affect the policy outcomes? Yeah, I think there's there's definitely a role for that. It's, it's something that we haven't had an opportunity to look at yet, really. Um, the book doesn't focus very much on this, and I think it's a really important set of questions is, is once you have this understanding that okay, projectification is a kind of phenomena that we're all facing and, um, and there are these kind of tensions between project management and policy making, then, then what's next? What do you do with that? And I think there's any number of ways in which you could open up the conversation a bit more between 
what you might think of as the permanent administration and the, the temporary or the, or the project-based organizations that come around that administration and help it implement its work. Um, so I think there is the potential for trying to open up policymakers to a bit more of the different kinds of uncertainty that I've spoken about and, uh, and perhaps to see the limits and the usefulness of some of the tools that they use and, uh, and, to, and to open that conversation up a little bit more on both sides. Um, I think uh, there is definitely a case for reversing to politicization and recognizing uh, project managers as the workforce responsible for policy delivery and uh, including them in early consultations on policy design and implementation. Absolutely, I, I think that's, that's an excellent point. I think one of the things that project tools do really well is, is kind of make processes visible and sometimes political processes can be very far removed as you noted with the EU and, and can be a bit invisible to voters so I think um, policy management and policy uh, project management and tools are one way in which you could you could try and make that more visible and, and open the conversation up to a much wider group of people in which case you would be talking about you know the opposite of depoliticization in some ways you know you'd be talking about democratization which would which would be an interesting thing to to do some research on. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Simon. Uh, this has been fascinating. As a practicing project manager, I have always felt political and organizational power behind project management. And the analysis presented in your book helped me to understand how thoughtless reliance on projects can disbenefit organizations and society overall. Uh, I would recommend all project managers, especially those working in public sector, uh, completing the policy officer course at the University of Kent and reading a uh, book, Projectification of Public Sector. Yeah, well, thank you very much. It's been fascinating to engage with the book again in this way. Um, and I think you know, you're right to note the power of, of project management. It's a powerful set of tools. And I think when you're in an environment like politics, then power comes with responsibility. And so there's definitely a conversation to take forward then. Thank you, sir. Thank you.